Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Recruit Military Live, a series of live broadcasts covering all things military transition, veteran employment, mill spouse employment, and much, much more. My name is Lucas Conley, retired U.S. Army officer and former TAP program manager, here to help you navigate the turbulent waters of transitioning from military service to a civilian career. If you're in search of meaningful employment while well, you're in the right place, please visit rmvets.com slash live to learn more. Okay, folks, let's roll right into today's show. Coming to us live from Fort Knox, Kentucky, today's guest is a retired U.S. Army colonel with a long and distinguished military career spanning over 24 years. Commissioned in 1983, he served in over 25 countries with the majority of his career in the special operations community. His career culminated in not one but two brigade-level commands, including a 4,000-person, seven-nation, combined joint special operations task force in Afghanistan. Following his retirement, Colonel Hurd has gone on to serve as the National Director of the U.S. Army's Transition Assistance Program, headquartered at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Under his leadership, the U.S. Army TAP program has transformed into a robust, fully comprehensive program, which assists an average of 100,000 soldiers per year in their transitions to civilian life. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Walter Hurd. Mr. Hurd, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, Lucas, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you. And thank you for taking the time to be with us. I really appreciate it. And for those of you out there in the audience, now that you know who we are, we'd love to hear who you are. Hit us up in that chat window. Let us know where you're watching from, who you are, who you're with, who you served with, and what your current status is. Are you about to retire, transition after a single term of service, or have you been out for a while and thinking about a career change? Given the time, we'll address your questions, comments, and concerns in the chat. Okay, sir. We are, as they say down on the flight line, wheels up. Now, I think we all know mission requirements take uh, the highest priority when you're on active duty. Oftentimes, that sense of immediacy and urgency causes transitioning services, service members to procrastinate. They make their transition a secondary priority. I think we both know that can have disastrous consequences. But anybody who's been around the, the Army TAP program offices has no doubt heard the phrase or seen the, uh, the slogan emblazoned on a poster, go early and go often. What does this mean and why is it so important? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Lucas. It really kind of rolls up what we do. I mean, clearly the mission priorities should be our priority. That's why America has an army to fight and win America's wars. As a side effect for that, though, uh, we produce about 100,000 veterans per year. And that go early, go often mantra that we have really gets to the bottom line. And I will tell you that the transition effort is like physical training. Now, people think I'm crazy when I say that, but if you think about the Army PT test, either the old one or the new one, you don't wait until just a couple of weeks before the PT test and then do push-ups for eight hours a day and sit-ups for uh, you know a long time every day. That just doesn't work. What you have to do is do an hour or so of PT every day so that after you know several months, you're ready to go. And thinking about transition is the same. You don't need it for an hour or two every day, clearly, but you need to start that thinking process long before you actually take the test. And everybody's going to take that test. Uh, a young soldier, maybe with three or four years on active duty, an old soldier with 30 years on active duty, uh, perhaps a National Guardsman or reservist who's mobilized maybe for six or 12 or 18 months. Uh, everybody, though, ultimately takes that test of taking off their uniform and putting on some version of a civilian clothes. So the key to success we found is to start that process early. And really it's not just, uh, you know, somebody's good idea. Data shows that soldiers who begin TAP and begin thinking about their next goal uh, early are twice as likely, Lucas, to find meaningful employment. So, you know, by show of hands, how many soldiers want to be twice as likely to find a good job? Well, yeah. Everyone. Leaders, commanders, how many want to help your soldiers be twice as likely to find a good job? Well, absolutely. So the best way to do that, quite simply, go early and then go often, frequent uh, pieces. You don't have to go early for eight months straight, but you go a year or a year and a half early. And really, it's a, it's a day every month or two is kind of what it looks like. Uh, if you add it all up, it's a couple of weeks, but scattered out over a year and a half or so. Again, much like PT, if you add PT up, it's not a lot of time, but you scatter it out over months and months and months, so you're ready. 
Right. And then the old adage, you know, if you wait till the last minute, it only takes a minute. They just it just doesn't. That's just not true. You can't you can't squeeze it all in effectively at the last minute. I think the recommendation for retirees is is it 24 months? Yeah. So what we recommend is people who are retiring uh, 24 months, everybody else, 18 months. Uh, con- congressional mandate uh, is that you have to start no later than 12 months before the date under DD 214. So we, the Army, actually reports to Congress uh, frequently how many soldiers started this 12 months out. And, I, and I'll tell you another interesting tidbit, if I can get off that subject just a little bit, but but uh, we found Army leaders from the Chief of Staff to the ACOM commanders all the way down are more and more frequently asking those questions of their subordinate leaders. How many of your soldiers started at least 12 months out and how many of your soldiers did all the required uh, mandates based on their tier level. So I think that's a great news story for us. And we're very, very excited to see that spread out throughout the army culture. As you know, Lucas, that was not the case years ago uh, when you retired, certainly not the case when I retired. Um, And and as a commander, I, I unfortunately did not ask my soldiers simple questions like, what are you going to do? What's your plan? It, it just never got around to me to ask that question. So we're trying to let the current generation of leaders and commanders uh, to educate them. So they ask that simple question. What are you going to do? Yeah, what this is, is absolutely, I, I recall, of course, the last time I commanded was at the company level. And that was many, many years ago. I won't, I won't give away my age. It was somewhere around 2006, 2007. And uh, I, if I, if my memory serves me correctly, there were only there was a very small portion of the program that was required. The rest was uh, was optional. And I think as a commander, um, as many of us commanders with a, a mission focused, especially at that time uh, in, in our military history, in our recent military history, uh, we often balked at the idea that uh, we had to lose a soldier, we had to lose a group of soldiers because they had some tap requirements. It, it all seemed like some form of malingering. We were wrong. Uh, what do commanders now, today, post NDAA 2016, need to understand about the TAP program? Yeah, another good question. So, you know, commanders and leaders and sergeants major and first sergeants, et cetera, need to be mission focused. Again, that's why they exist. We give them the authority to accomplish that. But what they might not understand, and I didn't understand as a commander, is that part of that mission is that the number one priority in our army is people first Uh, and part of people first, just like PT, just like medical uh, appointments. Part of that people first is to set soldiers up for success in a 100% guaranteed event in their life, which is to transition off of active duty. So uh, once we, once commanders and leaders start to realize uh, that this requirement uh, is not just some arbitrary rule uh, army policy or law, but it's really a moral requirement, uh, Lucas, to prepare each and every one of your soldiers. You know, they might not all PCS, they might not all get a promotion, they might not all get a battle, but they are all, every single one, going to take off the uniform and, and put on some variant of what you and I are wearing. So it's really that moral requirement. Uh, the last mission a soldier has for himself or herself And the last mission a leader has uh, for that soldier is to take care of them uh, and prepare and allow them to prepare themselves for transition. You know, I tell uh, I tell folks that uh, leaders would not let their soldiers go out on a patrol without ammunition. That would be criminal. It would be moral, morally obscene. Uh, So neither should we let our soldiers go out on the ultimate patrol, the one that's going to last the rest of their life in the civilian sector without properly arming them with the knowledge and the, and the technique to do what needs to be done. And, and I think to, to that point, there's something to be said about how veterans, transitioning service members who are about to become veterans, uh, carry the message of military service uh, to the rest of the civilian population. Those service members who've had a positive experience starting all the way at MEPS all the way right up to their DD-214 and their, their their transition out can be some of the, the best advocates for military service and some of our best recruiters. A- absolutely right. The number one recruiter is a, well, is a successfully discharged soldier 
who tells his or her protégés back at the high school, their nieces and nephews, their children and grandchildren, um, not only who verbally tells them uh, that the Army was, was good to me, and that's not just tap, obviously, but that's, that's the soup to nuts, but really so that those young protégés can see the veteran being successful. You know, Army veterans are, are more successful as entrepreneurs. They're more successful as college graduates. They're more successful as employees than their non-Army counterparts. Uh, so it's not just the moral requirement to take care of that veteran. It really takes care of our service and, and ultimately the whole country because we obviously need successful entrepreneurs, successful academics, and successful uh, employees to make a, to keep America um, on the on the great status that we are. So uh, it's a win win situation. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I think we we know, or many of us know, that uh, when we came to the uniform for the first time, many of us lacked direction. Um, I know that if you had asked me when I was 19 or 20 what I wanted to be doing when I was 40 or 50, I, I there's no way I, I didn't know what I was doing. And many of our service members come in lacking direction as well, not knowing what they want to do with their lives. And oddly enough, many also end their careers with a similar lack of direction, not knowing what they want to do with the rest of their civilian lives. What kind of questions should transitioning service members be asking themselves as they begin this transition process? Well, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Um, uh, a lot of soldiers didn't, and, and it's realistic, frankly, nobody has is expected to have their whole life mapped out at age 20. That's just not realistic. Um, but the key is to, to, as you begin this process early, to really identify where I want to be in five years, to draw a picture, literally, do I want to be white picket fence in the suburbs? Do I want to be in the city? Do I want to be driving a tractor? And then, of course, you identify milestones to get you from here to there. And you can't do that in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you can do that in the last couple of years uh, when you think about it uh, so that you have a plan. Uh, you've heard the old expression, if you don't have a plan, uh, any route will get you there, right? True. Um, and that's not the right answer. It's not the right answer financially or educationally or relationship or morally or anything else. Uh, same thing with transition. Uh, have a plan and it's okay to change it. And that's fine. Uh, uh, maybe you plan to go uh, to school and ultimately become a lawyer, but halfway through you realize that's really not what you want to do. You want to get into business or manufacturing or sales or whatever. That's all good. Uh, but the key is the plan. So as one of the reasons we try to stress go early, the very first thing a soldier does 12 to 18 months out is to sit down with the counselor and really talk through in plain English what do you want to do? What are your skills? Uh, what do you like to do? Uh, and, and, you know, there are short-term goals and long-term goals. Short-term goals, you know, I, I got to make a little bit of money so that I can make my car payments. That's a good goal. So let's talk about how to do that. Long-term goals, you know, I want to whatever, own a house, finish college, do whatever it is you want to do, uh, own my own company, whatever it could be. So we found really that there's three questions that will drive the rest of your life. And, and if you can answer those, the earlier you answer those questions, the easier it's going to be. Uh, you don't necessarily have to answer them immediately, but you need to prioritize them as soon as possible. And, and the three questions to be prioritized, where do I want to live? What do I want to do? Or how much money do I need to make? One of those three is the most important question that a soldier needs to answer, and they need to prioritize it. In my case, it was where do I want to live? I knew 40 years ago, how about that for a long period of time, when I was commissioned, I knew 40 years ago that I was coming back home uh, to Kentucky. Uh, and, and then I, you kind of set those milestones. Other people, it might be a different location, obviously, or a different career choice. Maybe they want to be a lawyer. doesn't matter where. I want to be a school teacher. Don't really care where. Um, and then they can march in that direction. Uh, absolutely. And, and you hear from many, uh, from many different sources, the difference between a dream and a goal is the action you put into it. So the sooner they can figure these things out and start putting tangible actions in, in place, uh, the better the transition is going to be. What, um, now, the program has its minimum requirements. The program has additional optional requirements. We've talked about making sure you have enough time. Once you've kind of marked off the time and said it's time to get started, it's time to go early, and go often. 
What would you say is the key to getting the most out of what the program has to offer? Yeah, well, great question. And and I tell you, the answer is the individual soldier has got to own it. It's their transition. Their squad leader, their company commander, their commanding general is not going to not going to walk them through. They're not going to hold their hands. The soldiers got to own it. They've got to make it happen. They've got to envision. They've got to put the intellectual power and, and, and energy into it and then make make plans and execute those plans. Again, kind of like PT. You know, you can go to formation at 630 and you can kind of do a couple of push-ups and, and hit your knees and not really work hard and you're not going to do very well. Or you can really internalize it and own it and maximize each repetition uh, uh, as much as possible. And then you're going to do pretty well on the PT test. So we see soldiers, uh, uh, again, 100,000 a year. Obviously, you see a lot from extreme good to extreme bad. But unfortunately, there are some soldiers who don't really own it. They just kind of sit there like a bump on a log and and, and play on their phone or, or go to sleep or do something in these classes that are really talking about important stuff. Like, let's talk about budgets. How are you going to pay the bills? Mm-hmm. That's important. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're going or where you're coming from. you got to figure out how to pay the bills. And, and let's talk about a resume that really puts your life on a piece of paper so that somebody is interested in offering you the kind of options that you're looking forward to. So you, you got to pay attention. you got to own it. Uh, and if you do that, you'll be okay. If you don't, you might not. Yeah, I think I heard someone tell me one time, and I wish I could remember who said it. They said, once you realize that you're responsible for everything, you're capable of anything. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> once we get involved in the TAP program, we start getting signed up. What are some of the things that the TAP program is able to offer, is able to put in front of service members to help them prepare for the next stage in their life? I'll tell you, we offer a lot. Um, you know, we offer some 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 skills, okay, some hard skills, how to write a resume, how to uh, identify a budget, how to take your MOS and the skills that you've learned uh, and then link that to what may or may not be uh, a common civilian uh, opportunity. And I say may or may not, you may want to follow the same skill set or you may not, and that's okay. Um, really what we, what we try to teach is not so much what to know, but how to learn, okay? Mm-hmm. How to think, not what to think, how to think. Because as you said, uh, once you take off that uniform and you're making your own decisions, nobody's telling you that the first call is at 0600 and PT is at 0630 and breakfast is 0800. Nobody tells you that, uh, but you've got to figure it out on your own. You got to figure out what to wear. You know, that was a hard one for me as an old soldier. Life's pretty simple. As far as getting dressed in the morning, I know exactly what I'm wearing every day for the you know the years and years. Uh, as a civilian, that's probably not the case. It might be in some cases, but probably not. So what we try to do is is, is teach soldiers. Uh, I won't say teach them, but review with them how to think. And I say it's not a new skill because soldiers uh, from from day one learn how to make decision making and learn how to make decisions. You know, we have a very deliberate process uh, in the Army called MDMP, Military Decision-Making Process. Uh, and, and civilian decisions need to be made the same way. You might not draw it out on a chart with facts and assumptions and implied tasks and specified tasks, but you still go through the same intellectual exercise. Here's all my options. Here's what I think is important. Maybe it's location, maybe it's salary, maybe it's what I do. And here's my options. So let's kind of cross-reference and then come up with a course of action to get me from here to there. Um, and then you tweak that course of action a little bit as you as you move out once you cross the LD line of departure. Uh, so really, we try to understand that the same thing you've been doing in the Army, whether you're a private, you know, a sergeant major or, or, or something else, uh, that same process is still valuable and it's still important. Industry is desperate for it. Uh, we have it. So we try to let soldiers, given the time to think about it, realize that some of those same processes uh, work on the outside, just like they do on the inside. And, and in fact, there's there. I don't think there's any shortage of business books out there 
uh, of, of different styles and certifications and PMP and Agile and Scrum and all the Harvard Business Review materials and the Jordan Petersons. And it almost seems like the whole rest of the civilian world is trying to figure out how to do what us poor majors learn to do ad nauseum in that deliberate decision-making process. And uh, I, I think yeah. a lot of these folks, business leaders could probably, you know, do with a, a quick, a quick uh, visit to Fort Leavenworth and come out uh, learning what, what decision-making looks like or really how painful it can be depending on who you are on the staff. Process, yeah. That process, Lucas, as you know, it's incumbent all up and down the chain of command, right? From the very top, to the very bottom, to the to the most junior private uh, in the motor pool, they still go through some kind of process saying, okay, here's my task. Here's three ways to get there. Let me prioritize and synchronize and, and make it happen. Um, and that's extremely valuable, that, uh, that intellectualizing how to think. So with the TAP process, if you own it, uh, rather than just sitting like a bump on a log in the back of the class, uh, snoozing or texting somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you really, if you really use it, boy, it'll make pay big, big dividends. You've heard the metaphor. Uh, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, uh, yep. which is true. I'm in Kentucky. I know a little bit about horses. Uh, if they're, thir if they're thirsty, they'll eventually drink. Uh, the challenge with tap is a lot of times the soldiers aren't thirsty until it's too late until they've left the water. Uh, and water is that tap process. So start it early and drink while you can. Now, there's, there's no doubt that over the past 30 years, the transitioning from the military service uh, has changed significantly. Sure. My own father told me that uh, when he left the Air Force, uh, his tech sergeant slapped him on the back and said, good luck, John, try to stay out of jail. That's not much of what I would call a transition assistance program. Fast forward to the modern era post-2016, we have a pretty robust program that commanders need to understand they own just as much as a service member. What does the future hold for the, the TAP programs going forward? Well, yeah. So I'll tell you, the future is promising. Uh, and you're right. TAP has changed dramatically uh, in the last, well, the last three, three decades, uh, less than 25 years ago, we really didn't have a TAP program. Uh, there were some benefits, some GI Bill benefits, and, and a lot of soldiers took advantage of it. My father and, and, 10 million of his best friends out of World War II took advantage of those. Uh, so, so with the onset, I'll call it the modern transition program. It's really changed originally in the early 90s from a voluntary program. You know, we encourage it, but just take what you want. Uh, and then about 10 years ago in 2011 to a mandatory everybody must do everything program. And that didn't make a lot of sense because, you know, people need different amounts of stuff. Uh, I sat next to uh, a soldier, I think, at Fort Bragg one time uh, who was an, an anesthesiologist. And she was going through the TAP program right next to uh, a diesel mechanic. Now, those two have dramatically different goals and, and opportunities. So based on that brief interaction, uh, the Army was able, frankly, to, to get with Congress and change the law so that we have a more flexible, tailorable program so that you can get the skills and setup that you need and I can get the skills and preparation that I need and somebody else can get what they need. And they're not always the same. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So what I anticipate uh, in the future is that it's more customizable. That's not an actual word, but I think you know what I'm talking about. I'm with you. One, with the flexibility so that different people get what they need. And also that, that our information conduit and our tracking system um, is more flexible so that leaders and commanders can really see what's going on with their soldiers. Uh, and then when they see that, they can ask questions and they can support it and they can kind of make it happen. Um, again, you, you, you can imagine a hundred scenarios. Uh, I will tell you that it, it kind of rang home to me when I was power, uh, pinning a retirement medal on a soldier, uh, who used to work for me, who was retiring. Uh, this was years ago. And that was the only time as he was getting his medal pinned on his BDUs, the only time that I as a battalion commander uh, asked him, so what are your plans? What are you going to do next? I realized now, boy, I should have asked him that a year ago. Okay. Or maybe a couple of years ago, I'd known him for three tours in the same battalion. Uh, so we're trying to set the, set the conditions so that commanders and leaders, first sergeants, squad leaders all the way up and down can ask those questions. Hey, Joe, 
What are your plans? I'm getting out of the army. Okay. What are your plans? You still have to have plans. Uh, get, staying in or getting out is not a plan. It's just, it's the first step. Uh, and really have that discussion. So I, I look forward for a more flexible program and a program with better uh, information flow up and down the, the food chain so soldiers can um, really benefit and therefore society uh, in the Army can benefit. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, and it's no doubt that those changes are being felt and appreciated with our transitioning service members. Now, sir, imagine if you would that you have just a few seconds to talk with one service member who's transitioning out. Call it 30 seconds in an elevator. If you could give him just one piece of advice, him or her, just one piece of advice, what do you think that piece of advice would be? You got to own this thing. At the end of the day, the Army's going to pat you on the back. Uh, we're going to say thank you very much. And then you're on your own. So we're trying to prepare you. We're trying to offer you the opportunities, but you young soldier or old soldier have got to own it deep down in your soul. And that's the same thing I tell uh, to leaders. You have a moral responsibility to take care of soldiers. And that means helping them on their final patrol, give them the ammunition they need, send them out. Absolutely. Uh, sounds fantastic. Uh, it makes me wish I could go back and do it all over again. Uh, Mr. Hurd, if folks want to learn more about the Army TAP program, where can they go to find more information? Yeah, great question. So we have, like a lot of organizations, of course, web pages. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook. Uh, we've got a web page, Army TAP at Army.mil. Or just get on Google and type in Army Transition Assistance Program, and you can find our web page that way. The Army, and only the Army, by the way, has a 24 7 virtual tap center. So if it's midnight on Saturday night and a soldier and spouse want to talk about their budget or work on their resume, there's a real life counselor with a master's degree uh, on the other end of a, of a computer link. Uh, so go to the web page uh, and, and play around with it. And you'll find our transition virtual center and you can talk to somebody midnight, Saturday, or you name the time and they'll help you through all the things that you need. That is awesome. 24, seven, 365, around the world or around the corner, there's a tap center available to support you. Yeah. Now we are closed on Christmas and Thanksgiving and I think New Year's, but other than that, we're wide open. Amazing. Mr. Hurd, thank you so very much today for being with us. Uh, I really appreciate your time uh, and sharing the information about the tap program with our audience. Thank you, Lucas, for your service. Uh, and, and I appreciate everybody out there listening. Uh, this is really exciting and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And for the folks out there in the audience, if you haven't already done so, go to www.recruitmilitary.com, where you'll find over 400,000 opportunities from 16,000 plus employers. Recruit Military is on a mission to help veterans, transitioning service members, and mill spouses alike find meaningful employment. On behalf of Recruit Military and the folks that were kind enough to join us in the audience today, thank you very much, Mr. Hurd, for being on the show. Thank you. And for those of you who want to learn more about how to have a great transition as you leave the service, tune in next week when we hear from Ms. Mrs. Colleen Drum of the Syracuse University Institute for Veterans and Military Families. She'll be talking to us about the amazing programs at uh, Syracuse University and the IVMF that are supporting transitioning service members, veterans, and male spouses alike who are interested in pursuing professional certifications to enhance their career progression. We hope to see you then. Until then. This has been Lucas Conley for Recruit Military Live. Good luck and Godspeed.